Okay, here's the final video of this October 2024 Unit 1 Physics exam from Edexcel International A-Level uh, for students who are preparing for their uh, unit exam in two days' time. Today's Monday, I think the exam's on Wednesday. I have uh, one student who's definitely retaking it and um, other students who are currently learning this unit but are doing the linear exam. So um, I'm moving across to the linear. So I've done this unit now for you guys, and I'll continue to support the international A-level. Uh, next term, I'll be focusing on units two and five. Um, so hopefully you'll be following this channel. So please like, share, and subscribe so you know when future videos are being uploaded. So if you haven't seen all the previous parts, this is the final part of this video. The longer questions are in one part on their own. So the last uh, part I did was on question 18. And this is the final question and it's to do with Stokes law. Okay, so let's get straight into it. It says a deep sea diver is a person who swims at great depths below the surface of the sea to help a, sea, a deep sea diver move downwards quickly spherical masses, I'm circling spherical, are attached to the diver. There's no reason for them to be spherical, except for this exam question, it will make sense when you think about it. During a dive, one mass uh, which is spherical, one mass which is spherical, became unattached and fell to the bottom of the sea. State the conditions for Stokes' law to apply so Stokes' law is a simplification of um, resistive forces uh, due to fluid move, movement through fluids. So the conditions are that it must be small and it must be spherical. So that's why they're saying these masses are spherical. In reality, divers don't use spherical masses. From my experience, having dived uh, many times before, uh, we use uh, lead weights on a belt and they have slots in them. But for this question, they want you to um, consider the conditions required for Stokes' law to apply and it only is applicable to spherical objects. So, hence the question. And it must be at slow speeds, yeah? Because at speeds, at slow speeds, it will ensure laminar flow, okay? So the key terms are laminar fl flow and small spherical objects. If it's not moving at a slow speed, then it will uh, create turbulence. And turbulence means that the physics becomes more complicated and Stokes' law will not apply. Okay, so that's your two marks. It then says the mass, the spherical mass, yeah, accelerated to terminal velocity. That means it reaches its uh, constant speed as it fell to the bottom of the sea. And you can work out its terminal velocity because the mass fell 25 meters in a time of 0.3 seconds. So immediately you know that velocity is distance over uh, time. So you just divide the 25 by the 0.36 seconds and you can work out that the terminal velocity was 69.4 meters per second to three significant figures, okay? Let's use three significant figures for now, even though the data provided is two significant figures. It then says there was a difference uh, of 4.6 newtons between the weight of the mass and the upthrust, okay? Well, if we know that weight is downwards, upthrust is upwards, and of, of course, while it's falling, there's also drag that's upwards. So the difference between the weight and the upthrust, if it's moving at terminal velocity, means the forces must be balanced. That means the rest of the 4.6 newtons must be equal to the drag force. Okay? So consider this because of the diagram. The drag force must be the difference between the weight and the, um, the weight and the upthrust. Okay? And then it says a spherical mass has a volume of 45 centimeters cubed. Yeah. Now that means 
if you want to take it into meters cube, which you uh, need to do, I think you need to do, or unless you want to put everything, yeah, because here we've got meters in the distance. So we need to put centimeters cubed into meters cubed. So centimeters cubed is three dimensions. So it's 10 to the minus two centimeters to meters, and that's cubed for each dimension. So it would be 10 to the minus six, 45 times 10 to the minus six in meters cubed, okay? So if you can understand that, changing units is a big part of A-level physics, and it's one of the ways they differentiate between good students and bad, bad students, or less good students, I should say, okay? So the difference in grades is that students uh, notice that they need to change centimeters cubed, for example, into meters cubed to be consistent. Now, you've got to deduce whether Stokes' law applies, um, considering what I told you. Well, if Stokes' law applies, that means the drag force here should be equal to 4.6 newtons. Now, they've given us what the viscosity is for water. So we know what eta is, that is the uh, curly n, and 6 pi radius um, we have to calculate. Yeah, because we know the volume. So once you know the volume, so you take the volume, which is from here, and you use the volume, because it's spherical, to be able to work out the radius. And if you do the, the maths correctly, you, you can make our uh, cube the, the subject of the equation, then cube root it to find that the radius is uh, approximately 0 0.02 uh, meters. So to three significant figures, I've written it down for our calculations. You want to keep your calculations accurate and precise. So you do use extra significant figures in interim calculations. And once you do that, you you've now got the radius to put into the Stokes law equation. And we know uh, the velocity from the calculation above. Yeah, so the velocity we calculated first. So we know V. We've been given eta. Um, so velocity we know. Eta has been given here. And obviously, then we can work out what the force is according to the data provided to enter into this equation. And once you do that, you find that the force you calculate is tiny. Yeah? So we put all the numbers in and we find that it's a fraction of a newton, 0 0.0347 newtons to three significant figures. Well, that's way less than the 4.6 newtons that would create a balanced situation according to our force diagram. So you've got to say, since, since uh, the calculated value is much less than the difference between the weight and the upthrust, which was given as 4.6 newtons, since it's much less, Stokes' law appears not to apply, does not apply, based on these figures. And that's all you can say. You can't say anything else, but you have to relate it back to uh, whether Stokes' law, in your understanding, will apply uh, as this spherical mass fell through the water. Okay? So that's the first part of the question. It then gives you some um, a motion graph of velocity against time. The graph shows how the vertical velocity of the diver varied during a dive. So this is the diver. It's no longer analyzing the velocity of the spherical mass. We're looking at the diver. Okay. So obviously the diver goes down. And uh, you could say that this must be when he's going down. Yeah. And this must be when he's coming back up. Yeah? Because the direction is different. Yeah? One is a positive direction. Uh, displacement is positive, And one, the displacement is negative. So here, the displacement is positive up there. Yeah? So positive displacement versus negative displacement. The diver was at the surface initially, 
at zero seconds. So we know the diver started at zero, yeah? And he was at the surface there. And we want to explain how the graph could be used to show that a diver reached the surface of the sea again at the end of the graph at 82 seconds, okay? So then, to do that, um, we've got to explain that the area between the line and the x-axis is displacement because the area under the velocity time graph, so we're talking about this one and this one. These are the two displacements. Okay, below the x-axis is negative displacement, yeah, when he's going down. And above the x-axis is positive di displacement, so it must be when he's going back up. Okay? Now, if the area of the negative and the positive happen to match in magnitude, then you can say, uh, if the two areas, positive and negative, add up to zero, then the diver will be back to his starting point because his negative displacement moving down is equal to his positive movement when he's coming back up. The distance is the same, so if he starts at sea level, he will finish at the surface of the sea as well at 82 seconds. So that's how you get the two marks. And finally, the last question of this 80 mark exam is finished. It uh, is uh, we've reached it. Determine the vertical acceleration of the diver at 70 seconds. So we've got to look at 70 seconds on the graph. So you've got to go to the graph at 70 seconds. You've got to look at uh, create a tangent at 70 seconds, and then be able to work out the gradient um, at 70 seconds. So I've done that. So here is my tangent. This is my tangent. So I've drawn it uh, to be exactly at 70 seconds, which 70 seconds would be at this point. That means that's the point of the tangent that should be touching the curve. So I think I've done it reasonably accurately. So then I've shown on my graph that the velocity change, I've done it from 90 seconds to 40 seconds. So I know the time difference between here and here is, 40, is 50 seconds. And the velocity difference is uh, negative because it goes down, it's a, it's a negative gradient. So the velocity difference is 0.2 minus 0.6 in the change in the velocity and the change in the time we've already done. It's 90 minus 40, so 50 seconds. So we show our data on the graph uh, very clearly. Uh, obviously, you won't have these highlightings in your exam, but I'm just explaining it to you. So once you know that you've got minus 0.4 on the uh, change in velocity, you then are doing this equation, change of velocity over time taken, from, which is basically the gradient of the graph, from the tangent, you do that, and then the numbers are minus 0.4 because it's a negative gradient, divided by the time taken, which was 50, and that gives you an answer according to my gradient of minus, I nearly forgot to put a minus in, 0 0.008 meters per second squared. And um, you could put a zero there if you want to make it two significant figures. I didn't. Hopefully I won't be penalized if I was a student. And that's how you get the three marks. One for seeing the tangent drawn at 70 seconds. One marks for showing the two values that you need to work out acceleration and one for the final answer. So there we go. We have done two uh, on my website, on the channel, two of the October 2024 papers, uh, the focus being unit four, which I did a few days ago, and now unit one. 
And if I ever get a chance, I will try and do units two and five for October 2024 uh, before the um, exams are next week. Uh, and if you, if you have a preference, um, you can vote for which one you want me to focus on because I also have uh, other exams I have to prepare for. So hopefully, I'm not promising 100% that I can do this because I have went back to work today and we're working full time and we got mock exams on. Um, so there's plenty of things that I need to get done. So I'm working to a tight schedule. But if you did have a chance to vote, would you, would I, am I getting more requests for unit five next or unit two next from the October 2024 um, series. Okay, so thank you for watching. Make sure you give it a like. Uh, I'm going to keep nagging you until I get more likes. Uh, share the video and subscribe and hopefully see you in a future video. Bye for now.